it's time for me to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Max McEwen. Now, Max is an expert on strategy, leadership, and innovation. And he's worked with Philips, Investec, Oracle, Microsoft, Pfizer, Virgin, and the list goes on. And this afternoon, he's going to tell us the truth about innovation, and he's pulling some very strange faces. He's very good looking, isn't he? And how to shape a better future by developing our inner strategists, nurturing ideas, and also facing adversity. Now, I can recommend this man's Twitter feed. He says some very interesting things, as well as talking about his opinion on what counts as the best and worst strategic decisions. And you get little gems like these. A lot of what brings results feels pointless for a long time. So please welcome my additional brain here for Innovation 2013, but here to deliver his fantastic presentation. Please give it up for our doctor in the house, Dr. Max McEwen. <laughs> Woo! Max, <laughs> nice to see you. Fantastic. So, uh, my name is Max McEwen, that's me, and I have written some incredible books that you really should buy. Uh, um, you're not interested in that, but if I come over here and I offer you very well-paid people a free book, you might then be interested. So who would like the best strategy book in the world free? <laughs> oh, you would. You would before bored. Before bored, now interested, yeah. Uh, or another copy of the world's best strategy book. Yeah, I did have a fourth book. Um, and this is the world's best book on innovation. This side gets the book. There you go, you get that book. So anyway, that's me. Um, the strategy book is the world's best-selling book on strategy as well. So you can buy that. Genius. Goddamn genius. Anyhow, my mother's very proud. And for the people who care about this stuff, my focus really is on how people, humans, shape the future. How do they do that? So we had, a, I remember Patrick Dixon, he was talking about, he kept saying something about, there's one word, one word that's changed everything. I don't even remember what the word was. But he kept saying one. And I was thinking, the one word that's changed everything about human history is people, because people make human history. You know, humans make human systems. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future, but we do know that if it's to be of any interest to us at all, it's going to involve us or people like us. So that's my focus. And along the way, I've done the academic thing, the deg uh, degree, MBA, MSc, doctorate in this, just the stuff you do. We've all got them um, uh, now. And I focused on this area, and I consult. But next um, slide. Oh, could we go one back? There we go. There. And my Japanese friends, who call me Dr. Max-san, uh, taught me that if you show an audience a picture of your family, they will like you, even if they do not, in fact, like anything else you say. So th this is my family, and we've got Ruben, who is 20, he's uh, finished his degree, and Zach over there just started, Bronte, who, who's 17, Steinbeck, who is seven, little blur, and um, uh, I, as a, a recommendation, I know the names of all my children, <laughs> and uh, uh, there aren't even any mystery children, just these, and uh, these children, and all with the same person uh, who did some of the work. And I will talk about uh, the, the amount of work I did that was involved in this a little later. Right, back to the future then. The future, which is my area. Now, you listened this morning to a, a bunch of, sorry, some, some esteemed and eminent futurologists and futurists, and they told you about the future. So can I ask you for a moment, since you're very, very clever people, what do you know about the future? What do you know? Anything. What do you know? Do you know anything about the future? It will come. It will come. Yeah, d probably. Probably. You know, I'm undecided. But 
we, we bet on that, yeah. So, so let's say, uh, will happen. Yeah, will happen. Well, what else do you know about the future? <laughs> Prob yeah, probably warmer than colder, then warmer than colder. Yeah, so, so yeah, so, some, um, some global warming shit. So, yeah, which will be very bad or very good. Other things, what do you know? Okay, so anything might. Okay. Some of these answers are wrong, but I'm trying to encourage participation at this stage. So, so anything. Yeah, anything. Other things? What, what else? What are you betting on? People over there, they must have opinions. Shout. Unpredictable, yeah. Okay, so anything might happen, it will happen. So, so usually I, I talk about the difference between things that are uncertain and then things that are certain. And you can usually put everything in both categories, uh, confusingly. You know, it will happen, but do you know the shape of it? Maybe, maybe not. Have you been surprised in your life? Did you grow up wanting to do the job you're doing? To be sleeping with whoever you're sleeping with? To have the kids that you have? Was that your plan? Or did shit happen along the way? I mean, it, it depends, um, really. Or wonderful, beautiful things happen along the way. A anything else? that you know about the future. This is your chance to be part of my board. You could say, my company will be successful. Wh what are you sure of? Okay, yeah, it, where are you from? Okay, yeah, yeah, probably invaded Poland. The, um, so yeah, death, that's lovely. And uh, as people who follow my work, death alone and in pain. Statistically. So, so the very most important thing in life is to die before the people you love, to get rid of that bit, and then to have a very good sort of a source of drugs. Yeah, so you should die in Amsterdam with a, a polygamous harem, for instance. Uh, anyway, so death. So m many things will happen. And in between certainty and uncertainty is something very interesting to us, and it's opportunity. Opportunity sits between certainty and uncertainty. If everything was completely certain, there'd be no point doing anything, because it's going to happen anyway. Fate, right? If everything is completely uncertain, completely random, why would you do anything either? So if you've done business in certain countries, um, Argentina's usually my pick, uh, things are so uncertain that nobody turns up for meetings because you don't know whether it will happen or not. And they had a national year of punctuality just to try to encourage government ministers to go to their own conferences on time or at all, which is, you always know, by the way, the most important person in the room he speaks about how it's important to engage with you and then leaves in a chauffeur-driven car. And that's a you know, politician, certainly, for you. Very important. I'm listening for about five minutes, but only during my own talk. So random things uh, and then completely sort of episodic, rigid things. Life's really neither of those, and that gives us opportunity and the opportunity is to shape the future. Now, if I ask you what kind of future you want, I don't mean whether you want a chip in the brain, which is just a funny idea, but uh, not whether you want one, but what kind of future do you want? Do you want a future that is worse than your current position? Anybody? Are you going to go for, you know, my life is so amazing it would only be right that it's worse in the future. Anybody want a better future than their current state? Anybody? Pretend to be American at this point, because it's so much easier. I even remind Americans to pretend to be American. It's just, you know, it makes us feel happy. You know the way that they clap when the plane lands? They do that in Poland as well, on Wizz Air. They clap, but in America it's congratulations, 
And in Poland, it's phew. <laughs> you know, so, so we'll just pretend. So who would like their life to be better, the future to be better? Anybody? Yeah? Just, just practice having an opinion. It, it's okay to, to do that, just to, you know, get into it. So, so you want anybody, there's usually two or three people whose life is so good that they want it to stay exactly the same for the rest of their life. Usually, if they're here with the object of their affection, if the person that you crave is in this room, you want to stay here forever. Anybody willing to admit that the only reason they came was because of that person? No, clearly not. But uh, if I need to be that person for you, uh, I will be. So random, episodic. Really, life it is more usually chaotic. That means that it has a shape, and the shape makes sense afterwards. I mean, you, that's also called lying to yourself. But, but, but it's chaotic, so, so it, it's sort of like this. And eventually, it's obvious how you got here. But the winners and losers are less obvious. And in my work, I, I divide things out to future terms between systems that are transcendent, they get out of the constraints of the current system, those that are thriving, most people are winning in this system, some losers, meritocratic, to those that are simply surviving, to systems that are collapsing. And you will all, in some part of your life, you might be part of any of these. It doesn't take that much more energy to be part of a transcendent system. It's just focusing that energy on the right point. We know that that's true. It doesn't, to, to run at, to travel today at 100 miles an hour doesn't take more effort than it used to take to walk at four miles an hour. It doesn't take more. You've just got a car in the middle. You know, you just have to, I almost need camera on foot, but you know, I'm now going faster. Feel my power. Uh, and everybody does that, that kind of thing. So random chaotic. What, how did you learn these kind of things and the things that you thought about? How did you learn about them? Where did you learn them? How do you know, for instance, that you will die? When you might not, you might have vampire blood, and your parents may reveal that to you at some point. How do you know? I will die, for instance, in 2043. I've gone to deathclock.com, and weirdly, when I went, it was when somebody was speaking, James was speaking, and he said, you don't know when you will die. So I went to deathclock.com so that I'd be right, and I found it already knew my dietary practices, whether I was a smoker and my age and birth date already, and told me I would die in 2043. So where do you learn all this stuff about the future? Where's it from? Observation, okay. When? When, yeah, the, definitely the past. So the, the, let's include yours. So you said observation. Observation, so that's one source here from the past. What, what are our other sources of information Experience, we, we call it. Experience that's so valuable. Experience is so valuable that if you've got enough, they force you to leave the workforce. Clearly, if experience uh, was sort of uh, uh, obviously more vital, if your value increased as a product of your age, they would never let you retire because you'd always be more useful to your dying day. But unfortunately, they decide that you're useless at some point and allow you to die alone and in pain. So experience, so other things, where, where do you learn everything from? Science, stuff you read, also crap you read that's not true, also stuff you've no idea where you learned it, you just do it anyway, a whole bunch of habits that control your life from the earliest days and even from before you were born. You know, birth, DNA, what you've got, the way that your mother fed you, 
the way your mother gurgled at you and you sort of burped. You made a little air and the, your mother said, that's a smile, you're such a lovely cherub. <laughs> and you, you went, something in your brain connected and it rerouted and said, ooh, ah, oh, I like that you watch, he'll smile more as I do it more. <laughs> he'll go, not, not, are you important, Robert? <laughs> no, to, so I can keep doing it. The, so, so you learn like that. And what we call learning is really a case of action leading to outcome. And this is what we mean by learning. Now you can learn stupid lessons and some lessons get stuck. They become habits or heuristics. This really means that we don't have to actively think about what we're doing, we just do it anyway. If you didn't have these habits and heuristics, you couldn't even get out of bed. Really clever people, English people, for instance, like Newton, he would wake up in the morning and he would sit on his bed. Well, it's taken him about seven hours of sleep, normally. Then he'd wake up and he'd be so struck by thought that he would sit on the edge of his bed and do nothing for hours, just struck by all these thoughts because he was a completely original thinker. But most of us rely on habit so that we can remember to get out of bed, to go and get something to eat, to say hello to somebody, then to, I don't know, get in the car, yell at the kids, all those lessons that we've learned through habit, habit and heuristics. So the good thing about this is that they're very, very efficient. The bad thing about them is that they can be very, very wrong and grow out of date. So let me ask him, um, has anybody ever made the same mistake more than once? Anybody? Remember, pretend to be American. It's going to be an acronym soon. It will be trending, um, like a nice American, not an American doing all the stuff like, I don't know, bugging Chancellor Merkel's phone, a good American. So if you can imagine such a thing. So have you made the same mistake twice? Have you ever made the same mistake three times or four times or five times and remembered each time I've learned that lesson before? I know I shouldn't, but I did. I mean, tonight is a great example. We will have an after party, and many people will think, do things that they know that they really shouldn't and regret them tomorrow. But at the same time, be proud that they forgot. And so that there's this process. So th this is because we are very, very clever, but also very, very stupid. Both of those things. And this is important to how we shape the future, because I, I don't know, if I was a futurologist, I'd put a statistic on it, so I'll pretend. So maybe 95%, 99.9% of what we do is just habitual. And it's that little bit of difference that makes the difference. So let's um, get, go forward uh, in time. Right. So from time to time, stuff happens in the present, in the now. And uh, d so we'll, we'll just add a now. It happens, and it happens like this. It's unexpected usually, and it's dramatic. And it's a WTF moment. And this what the fuck moment, I'm only explaining that, I didn't swear just in case you wonder, I'm just explaining that. A WTF moment is something outside, something external, that changes the direction of your travel. You didn't plan it, it happened anyway. It's external to you. And that's most uh, of these things. So if we move along here, there are these huge waves of change and nobody's responsible for them, but they still impact you. So you can choose to be left behind and stranded. You can choose to be smashed or sunk, or learn to surf. There's absolutely really nothing, oh, or if you're very creative, you can attempt, and also perhaps stupid, you can attempt to shape these waves to get in front of them, like Canute. 
surf shape stranded or smashed. But an awful lot of change and innovation is also created by WTFN moments, which is why the not. Why not? This is the creative obsessive who says, well, I, I think I could do that. That's very internally focused. The great thing about the WTFN moment is you're part of this surfing decision. You can position yourself in the right place. So, so all of these big things, um, the great global meltdown, big surf, big wave, you can't stop it, nobody was responsible. Or people's desire to take photos, that's a pretty huge one. Uh, but back in, whatever, 1826, you invent the camera. 1900, you invent the one dollar camera. And uh, whatever, 1975, they invent the digital camera. So in this intervening period, back here for the first 80 years, about three million photos were taken. We like cameras. Then about 300,000 per year were taken at this stage. So for 30 years, about a billion cap photos. By 1975, it's increased. And now, it's 380 billion photos every year. So what we can say about this trend, so, uh, so if I add that up, I've done earlier clearly, that's four trillion photos. So if you want a big trend, it's that humans like to remember shit they did. Memories, they like to do that. This is a big trend, a big trend. So you will always make money if you can help people to share their photos, clearly. Something that Kodak found very hard to realize despite the fact that they invented the digital camera. They just didn't get it. They invented it, but they couldn't do it. And this is an example where it's quite obvious that there's a wave, and it's quite possible to surf it, but they refuse to do so anyway. Give you another example. Uh, back in ancient Greece, a set of people thought about the telescope. And because they were at the top of society, up here, very intelligent people, they thought about it. We thought. We're thinkers. But they didn't know how to make anything. Because the makers were at the bottom of Greek society, down here, the makers. And these two groups didn't talk. And as a result, the glass makers, who could have made the telescope, and the thinkers who had designed the telescope didn't talk to each other for 1,400 years, which is quite a gap on time to market, <laughs> if, if you see on that. And they'd completely missed the window of opportunity, and other people had come in, the Venetians, uh, you know. And meanwhile, Greece just has like broken buildings and crappy museums, and also tear gas, which is popular. Um, yes, Greeks, yes. So thinkers and makers, when they get together, you usually find that they come up with innovations that people really want, and enough of these thinkers and makers get together, and they all experiment with lots and lots, mass experimentation, thousands or millions of attempts to do the same thing following the same wave. Lots. And this mass experimentation is hugely important to what all of you are attempting to do. Because one thing we know is that the ideas that work will best surf the existing waves, the things humans want. Now, most things that we want right now are things that rich people have had for a very, very long time. You know, food brought to your door in a second. Rich people, 2,000 years and counting, I think. They've had that door-to-door -door delivery. At one point in 1400s in Britain, they used to have people who would just warm your bed. A person would jump into your bed and warm it, just to make sure that it was at the right temperature. Rich people have had this stuff, and we are all trying to get it, essentially. And all these mass experiments, some of them work, some of them get connected, some of them succeed. So who invented the light bulb? Not Edison. Who made the light bulb work as a part of a 
integrated electrical system, Edison. All of these different connections, makers and thinkers. And when a maker and a thinker get together, really cool stuff happens. Really cool stuff. Uh, let's see, see so here. So you know that, um, that glue that you can buy? And um, it comes in two tubes. And you have to squeeze both out in order to make the, the glue. Two different colors. One of these, in this case, in innovation, is the think group. One's the makers. And when you get them together, you usually create an attempt at innovation, which will succeed or fail, one of the two. So somebody like Elon Musk, the PayPal guy, he teaches himself to program at 12. This means he's a thinker maker, thinker maker. And the great thing about those, like marketers, they come up with ideas, but they can't build anything. So either they've got money or they don't have money. If they've got money, they invest in makers to make what they've thought about. If they don't have money, they say, oh, I wish I'd done that. When you've got a thinker maker, you really get this kind of innovation going. So he teaches himself to program, then sells his company for whatever, 280 million. Then he buys a company with that money. That company has another group of maker thinkers who've invented PayPal. PayPal's not a big thing, but he, because he's a maker thinker, recognizes the value in it and turns the company into PayPal and then sells that for more money. And then he says, this mass experimentation, really cool. Why don't I set up prizes for that? Because that will encourage maker thinkers who don't get listened to in their own companies, will encourage them to do cool stuff. And then SpaceX comes out of it. And now we've got all that space travel stuff from frustrated maker thinkers who worked for NASA. And they went to NASA, the inventor of Spaceship One or whatever, went to NASA and they said, I've got a cheap way of building a space shuttle. And the executives and the managers at NASA said, it'll never work. Cost far too little money. You see, we have a deal here. Something's got to cost more than the country can afford before we will invest in it. So if you'd come to us with a $10 billion investment plan, we would have invested. But since this thing will only cost about 10, we won't. And so corporate politics and their approach that said things had to be complicated stopped investing. But Musk understands that. It's just one example, but you can think of others. The people who really change the world are maker thinkers, and they always have been. They're the Renaissance men and women who can do both. And if you can't make, or you can't think, hmm, if you can't make and think, you need to find another maker thinker. So I need a volunteer who I will probably choose in about five seconds. So volunteer, five, four, three, that person over there, that would be a great maker. I think this, this guy here with the red on, could you be my volunteer? Of course you can. Uh, there we, oh, you don't, okay. That would be funnier. <laughs> but do you just sit down, you sit down. That, well done anyway, very well done for not understanding anything I'm saying. That's good. Um, another volunteer around this section, who, who can we? You, come on up. Yeah, you can come on. So maker thinkers have to get together. And uh, if there's a thing for you to remember, it's this. So, so if I'm a thinker, if I'm one of you guys, how many people here can program? Yeah, OK, just a few. You'll get demoted. Don't worry about it. Um, everybody else is a thinker then, because you can't make anything. That means that you need to, so if I'm a thinker, I've got to be your friend, okay. because you're a maker. And we've got to be not just this far away, you know, where we shout at each other and send each other texts and stuff and write blogs. This is the European standard for distance. If I get closer than this, you'd get uncomfortable. Unless I was unusually good looking, in which case you'll probably stand <laughs> this much, you know? Closer than this, well, it depends. If I really catch your eyes, you're going, come on in. Go, you look, look, he's doing, look at that, look at that. It's like animal magnetism. 
I haven't even started. So we've got to be kind of this close, maker thinkers. You've got to find a pair. And this is really hugely important to you lot if you want to make stuff happen. The ideas are really important. Next person who says ideas are cheap should be shot. Well, obviously not really, because I'm not a fascist. But they should, in that they misunderstand that there are really great ideas, finished ideas, and then there are crappy ideas. They're not all equal. But we've got to be this close, you know, like this. We've got to be like dancing. Are you important? Are you important? No. No, it's all right. You're just Allegro. <laughs> <laughs> He'll put up with this. We paid for that. Yeah, yeah, you paid for this hug. So, so you know, it's the, this, this close. You've got to be dancing. And I've learned somewhere, maybe we'll know, that, that the more that you move your hips, the more attractive you become. <laughs> Even if you look stupid, this has been studied. It's real science. So in a, a discotheque, even the guy who's going like this, my son, the 20-year-old, does this. He dances like a little muppet. And then the girls just flock around him, going, <laughs> he's just such a nice Muppet, and he's got nice movement. So we've got to be this close. You liking that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but have a hug. Have a hug. There we go. <laughs> look, look. Let it out. Let it out. <laughs> little maker. Little maker. Yeah. It's like an earth hug. I'm the world's best hugger, no doubt. Anyway, that, that's more. Hey, can you sit down? You can. Round of applause. Okay, so if we're back to my board, yeah, back to the board. Maker thinkers need to get together because maker thinkers shape the future, along with users of the idea, who are sort of unusually um, important in this. It's the people who use the thing, and then the people who introduce new stuff, who then shape the future again, and it carries on wave after wave after wave. But the wave itself can't really be shaped. It can only be moved with. Look at any part of history, this is how, how we move. So, in strategic terms, we're definitely trying to move between a set of islands. We're trying to move between bloody islands. This is where everybody can do what you can do, and everybody understands why you're doing it. It's obvious land. Here lives obvious. And then you move to uh, beautiful. Now, beautiful is a lot, lot better because you can do something nobody else can. But everybody understands why you're doing it. So it's not bloody obvious, but it's pretty obvious. But it's hard. And this is much better than bloody. But ultimately, you're trying to get to paradise. And paradise is where, again, nobody can do what you can do. Nobody can do what you can do. And nobody understands why you're doing it. They just don't get it. It's too good. It's too weird. It's too helpful. It's too bold. It's too impossible. They don't understand. And the huge advantage of getting to paradise is that nobody else is even trying to get there. Nobody's going to copy you because no one understands what you're doing. So uh, as the, the obvious example, where, when, uh, when Apple decides to get rid of the keyboard from a phone, BlackBerry think that's weird. And they insist on keeping that little keyboard. It's very important to them. And they keep it even though people stop buying it. And the dominant design has become no keyboard, but they insist on keeping a keyboard. And that's, this means that Apple is completely free because poor little BlackBerry is unwilling to make the sacrifices mentally to get here. Because every jump here involves sacrifice. You have to give up an old idea to take hold of a new idea. You have to unlearn it, unlearn that habit. They had become the world's best company at making a phone with a keyboard people didn't want. And they still are, which is good to know, even in bankruptcy. And eventually, everything that you people do will be replaced by somebody if it's valuable and obvious. 
and easy, and that's the way the thing moves. And the thing that happens, this is my beautiful shark for you, the thing that happens with, with, with this, and the reason this happens is twofold. One, everybody is going to copy you eventually, and also because you will ignore what is happening in the world. You'll go mad. First of all, you'll minimize what the market is telling you, the external world. That's why you can say, make the same mistake 15 times in a row and then forget that you've made the same mistake. You will minimize what the world is telling you. You will attack the people who tell you that you're wrong. And then you'll deny that there is a problem at all. And in every company that's ever gone bust, that goes from really thriving up here to collapsing, has gone through a period of insanity where it's obvious to everybody else, if Kodak invented the digital camera, surely Kodak should have been the company that made loads of money from it, but they weren't. If Motorola were the people who invented the cell phone, surely they should be the world's most profitable phone company, but they're not, and so on and so forth. Right. So I need to uh, share with you a story then about my seven-year-old child. I told you I would tell you what part I had played in his, well, obviously, there was a great period of time um, in California. Then sometime afterwards, nine or so months, he was nearly ready to be born. Now, I have to tell you that I missed and messed up the first three births of my children. The first child, I was there. But for some reason, after being excited that he was born and saying, oh, he's wonderful, I decided to read a car magazine while the mother was really tired. And so, you know, my wife, she was really tired, and I'm reading this magazine. I don't know why. And so I really messed that up because I wasn't an attentive husband. Second one, I was in a meeting. Third child, I was also in a meeting, and he ended up born in an ambulance with lots of other people, but not me. So that was three bad results. I've made the same mistake three times, not learned. So on baby number four, I decided that I will guarantee, and I took two months off work, I stayed at home, I put lights in the trees, I hired a midwife, a nurse, and everything to be in the house so that I would be there. So I've learned something at last. And uh, the midwife says, Deborah, this baby is going to be maybe three, four hours. I'm going to go and get myself a coffee. So she went downstairs to get a coffee, and my wife said, this baby is coming now. I know. So she, she was stood up at the time. She was walking around. She wants a very natural birth. And so I had to catch the baby. And I caught the baby. It was a fantastic experience. And so I'm holding him, and he's covered in sort of blood and everything. And it's the best moment ever. And uh, he looked beautiful to me, but I think other people's babies are ugly. My baby beautiful, other people's babies ugly. So, so this is my, my little baby, you know, just like all other babies, ugly, with no hair. But I think he's beautiful. Other people think he's ugly. So he's ugly, plus he's beautiful. And he's not finished yet. I mean, they can't do anything, can they? They don't make their own food. They don't contribute to the household, which means they're exactly like ideas. When ideas are first born, when they come into the world, they're also ugly to everybody else, beautiful to the people who create them, and not finished yet. But at that stage, people judge the idea way too early instead of nurturing the idea, looking after the idea, and taking the, the, the little idea on a journey, raising him. You know, the, we have eyes, insights, and they turn into ideas, and they turn into maybe inventions, a first attempt, and then if we're really lucky, it becomes good, smart innovation. So if somebody comes up with an idea, it probably is something they love. So you better respect the ugly idea. 
and say, even if you hate it, where did that idea come from? What's the insight? Capture the insight and then build on the idea. And eventually, you get to the beautiful adult idea, the innovation that makes all the difference. So, along this journey, you're going to move from the past into the present, have these different decisions to make of how to get there, and you're going to want to innovate in a way that changes the way you do what you do and how you do it so that both are new. All the good stuff's in here. And usually, the two things that will stop you succeeding are, one, you don't have any makers. Your thinker-maker thing isn't working. Or you're unwilling to make the sacrifices required, the inefficiencies required to get you there because it damages what you do at the moment. And all of the innovation comes in this section here. That's what takes us into new territory. The willingness to do different things in different ways. And the people that we need to help us here are a particular group. You know, you have people who love rules, and you have people who love purpose or goals. People who love both are good soldiers. They just say, yes, sir, all the time. Good soldiers. And then you have people who are not good soldiers, but they're really fast conformers. And they pretend to love the company and keep the rules, but they don't. They're what we would call yes men. Then you have rebels. The rebel doesn't keep the rules and doesn't love the company. They're easy to spot. They're just saying this all the time to everybody. You know, and then we, they work in tech support, usually. The, um, and then you have the mavericks, finally. And these guys are the WTFN people. They don't keep the rules because they want to make things better. And the important thing here is that each of these groups are just, they're not really fixed groups, they're just behaviors. So people who start off as mavericks become rebels because nobody listens to them. Or they become fast conformers because their mortgage becomes way more important than changing the world. Or they become good soldiers. And you, as managers or thinkers, can affect the culture of your organization. And I suppose that, as a summary position, is how humans shape the future. They have habits, they have needs, that shapes their actions, and then every now and then, there are enough maker thinkers who do something new for people generally to say, that's better than the thing I had before, so I'll do it. And at that point, enough of those people do it, it becomes the dominant habit which shapes things again until, in the end, a new group of maverick maker thinkers do something new. And that, of course, is all of you, or at least a an important proportion. Thank you very much for your time. Now, what we're going to do is get Max to stick round by the board throughout the next day and a half. Obviously, you can come to the after-show party, you can go to bed at night, but we're going to keep referring back to some of the ideas that Max has come up with. And the reason why he's a doctor, as we've now discovered, is that you delivered your fourth baby. There so you yeah. That's it, isn't it? And I must say, wasn't his twerking good? We thought Miley Cyrus was good, but can we see those hips move again, please? W well, tonight. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Once more, thanks very much to Max McEwen. Thank you, Max. Thank you.